This story is about a young boy who is hated and tormented by society. Even his mother hated him and wanted him to disappear like his father. One day, he suddenly coughed up blood, and from that day on, his health got worse. His health was so bad that he couldn't walk properly. After suffering from so much pain, he died but wished to have a nice afterlife. His wish comes true because he reincarnates into a noble family as the youngest son. His life was going well, but one day his illness returns and his situation gets worse again. In this life, he has to become a mage or a swordsman to protect his town from the abyss monsters. Will he be able to get rid of his illness or will he spend his life in misery? Watch till the end to find out. The story begins with a child who was laughed at by the people around him. As he was walking, someone threw a rock at his head. Because of the impact, he injured his head and fell down, surrounded by other people. As he looked around, he realized his life was a nightmare. Every single person around him hated and tormented him. He had no idea what he did wrong and hoped that someone would be by his side, someone who loved him. As he got home, he called his mother. He was shocked to see something in the room. He saw his mother while their household was scattered around. She suddenly called his name and asked what state he was in again. Eugene wondered why his mom suddenly became like this. She asked him why he made her life so difficult and questioned the point of dressing, feeding, and sending him to school if he always ended up a mess. Eugene was so depressed after hearing his mother say she wanted him to disappear like his father if he continued like this. On that day, he thought his life couldn't get any worse. But when he coughed, he suddenly saw blood in his hands, making his life even worse. The day he went to the hospital with his mother, they immediately did a checkup. The doctor said he had a disease, but it was too complicated for him to remember. All he remembered was his mother's unfathomable gaze at him. After that day, his condition inevitably worsened with time. His disease made it difficult for him to stand, causing him to struggle to go to the bathroom on his own. One time, unable to hold it anymore, he suddenly fell to the floor. He was scared, knowing something was going to happen. His mom came out of her room and glared at him. Eugene kept apologizing for what he did and swore he would clean his mess, promising it wouldn't happen again. This was his first time getting wet by himself, so he didn't want his mother to abandon him. After that incident, he never saw his mom again. Eugene's life always cast him into misery without a sliver of hope for escape. Because of the pain and suffering, he hoped his afterlife would be different, where he wasn't sick and could receive love. As he opened his eyes, he was confused about where he was. He saw someone reaching out to him in the afterlife. She said that Eugene deserved more than his life and wanted him to take her hand. As Eugene did, his hand brightened up. After a long cycle of stars blooming and fading, she was happily glad they met again. In this time, Eugene's life would be free from pain, and he would find happiness in his next life. The next day, inside a village, someone was looking at a crib while another was sick. It turned out that Eugene was reincarnated as a child. As he fully opened his eyes, he realized he was born into a noble family and was the youngest son. His life became blissful, being born as a noble with his brothers. He felt like he had friends and a caring uncle and lastly he had loving parents. However, that happiness shattered instantly when his disease returned. Starting from when he was eight, his body began to stiffen. The cause was unknown and no treatments were effective. Because of this, he endured pointless treatments for over five years, losing hope. But somehow, he remembered the afterlife where the girl gave something to him. This made him realize something from his past life. It felt like an unfamiliar memory. He remembered meeting a wizard at the end, reminding him of the creator who brought forth all life upon the horizon. This was the wizard of creation and rebirth, Lord Phelan. However, he doubted why the creator would do such a thing for him. Suddenly, he felt so light, like his illness had been cured. He wondered about it, but suddenly someone lost their grip on something. It was his brother, who was startled to see Eugene so healthy. His brother was flustered, but cried to see Eugene finally healed. They ignored the reason and were happy to see him smiling again. He wanted to try walking, so his brother assisted him. 
As time passed and his memories of past and present lives settled, the questions he had been putting off came rushing back. But he was still wondering why the Creator chose him from his past life and bestowed such grace upon him. He also wondered what the Creator said to him that day. Despite attempts to understand the Creator's intention, he still couldn't find an answer that satisfied him. Therefore, he decided to stop worrying and live a life devoted to the Creator, Lord Phelan. As the youngest son of the great Folivia family, who guard the world from the abyss at the western borders of the horizon, he would live the life of Eugene Folivia. But he thought he overdid things when his uncle trained him so hard. His uncle ordered Eugene to stop whining and prioritize counterattacks because he only ended up losing without doing anything. Suddenly, Eugene disappeared into thin air. It turned out he saw an opening in his uncle's defense, but his uncle confidently knew he could block the attack. He was shocked that Eugene's attack was more powerful than before. He complimented Eugene for almost hitting him but noted that Eugene's exaggerated movements carried too much risk. Eugene surrendered, knowing he lost again. However, his uncle was happy to have a close call fighting him. Even though Eugene lost, his uncle knew he had potential unlike himself at Eugene's young age. All of a sudden, Eugene kneeled down, feeling like he was going to throw up. His uncle advised him to build better physical strength. Surprisingly, his uncle didn't expect Eugene to be like this after suffering from an incurable disease. Recently, Eugene had been putting a lot of effort into his rehabilitation. At first, he had a hard time walking, but as he proceeded with rehab, little by little, he was finally able to move like he used to. Now, even though he was fully recovered, his brother still worried about him too much. Suddenly, his uncle hugged him, gladly happy to see him healthy again. They were glad to see him getting up after being bedridden with his illness. Day by day, seeing him recover was precious for them. This man was his uncle, Adir Folivia, another parental figure who looked after him when he was young, in place of his sick father and self-involved mother. Adir had become independent from their family five years ago and had been working as a doctor in the capital. He rushed over as soon as he heard news of Eugene's recovery. Eugene felt nostalgic as he remembered how his uncle took care of him. However, someone coughed, and Eugene immediately felt a threat as people entered the room. An eerie feeling enveloped him. These people were the head of the family council, led by Edric Folivia. They laughed at him and made fun of him for being sick and a fugitive. Practicing their swordplay, they still considered themselves members of the Folivia family. They looked down on him for being a fugitive. However, their grandfather sarcastically said they must not make fun of them because they were still part of the Folivia family. Idir immediately said they were going to clean their mess because they just finished their training session, which their grandfather understood. However, he changed the topic. It had been a long time since he saw Idir still wielding a sword, which he never imagined from Idir's past. Idir had been abused by his father, who felt embarrassed by Idir's lack of skill compared to his brothers. Even though Adir was older than them, his brothers looked down on him. He was considered a disgrace to the Folivia family because he grew up being scolded by his father. His father reminisced about his past, and after his father died, Adir fled to the capital like a fugitive. He never thought he would give up the sword. He never knew that Adir had such perseverance. However, he sarcastically said these words, essentially blackmailing Adir for his origins as he was the only person who knew about it. He said he'd hate to answer noble families in the capital who asked if the Folivia family ever had such a dunce in their ranks, which was very embarrassing for a noble family. Adir swore this wouldn't happen since he was living quietly as a doctor. Eugene, however, wondered why they were insulting them. He began to shake with fear and silence after receiving such insults, but then he realized the whole reason as he looked at himself from the past. This fear was caused by the memories of his past life that bound him to its darkness. He realized that the high esteem Folivia family and the fugitives from the same family were like a matching pair. He understood why they hung around together but knew he didn't want his past life to be repeated. Finally, he had the courage to move. Without even hesitating, he punched one of Edric's grandsons. The weak and cowardly Eugene did this because he had no intention of being bound by the darkness of his past life. Because of his actions, everyone was startled to see him like this. 
The kind and polite Eugene began to lose control, demanding that Edric's grandson take back the words he said about Adir. He simultaneously punched him out of anger, swearing that only disgraceful people like them belittle others without knowing honor. He never wanted to stand by and do nothing, swearing he wouldn't be the same as he was in his past life. All of a sudden, he was startled to see a deer standing in front of him, blocking something. Because of his anger, he had no idea what had just happened around him. He was flustered to see Edric unsheath his sword in front of a deer. Edric was furious that Eugene had attacked one of his favorite grandsons. Edric's madness grew as he couldn't believe a low-life creature like Eugene had laid hands on his high-class grandson. But still, Eugene stood his ground to justify his actions. He explained that he did this because they insulted a deer, so he acted to protect his honor. Eugene was determined to be barbaric if they considered this, swearing they must learn of his barbarity. He also vowed he wouldn't hesitate to do this to his grandfather if he were an adult. However, Edric decided to sheath his sword but insulted Eugene, saying he thought he had the dignity of a decent person but saw him just like his mother's bloodline. He headed back and said he would hold the subhead of the family accountable for this matter. Eugene suddenly realized that the subhead of his family was his elder brother. He was nervous because his elder brother was scary. When he got home, his elder brother, Hindel Folivia, received the news about the commotion Eugene had caused. Hindel, acting in place of their ailing father, governed the Folivia domain as the subhead of the family. Their uncle came toward him because of the incident, assuming he couldn't discipline his younger sibling. Hindel was flustered to hear Edric trying to seek an opportunity to tarnish his brother's rule. Eugene tried to apologize to his brother since he had no idea this would become a big problem. He wanted to explain everything to the elders because he assumed they could understand him once they heard the whole story. However, his brother shouted at him in silence. Hindel explained to him the logic of nobility, emphasizing that their influence and standing were most important. Eugene felt guilty after realizing that violence wouldn't resolve everything. He was no longer a child who could do anything and be forgiven. Just as suddenly, his brother asked him what he thought Hindel had said when their great uncle yelled at them. Eugene had no idea about this. To his astonishment, Hindel had actually told their great uncle to shut his mouth. It turned out that his brother had stood his ground to defend Eugene's dignity and not to belittle anyone. Hindle had been worried that, after being sick for so long, Eugene might be intimidated by others. Luckily, he was relieved that this wasn't the case. Hindle advised him to remain confident and proud, reassuring him that he didn't need to cower. He was proud to see Eugene as the son of their mother and father and as his brother. As Eugene was about to hug his brother, Hindle stopped him. Even though Hindle liked what Eugene did, it didn't mean he could let him off without scolding. Hindle warned Eugene about associating with their uncle Adir. Eugene was confused as to why everyone hated his uncle Adir so much. Additionally, Hindle was mad because he had advised Eugene to focus on his recovery, but instead, he had been dueling and getting into fights. Consequently, Hindle decided to confine Eugene for a month, which flustered him. When Eugene returned to his room, he couldn't accept that he was confined for a month. Tyr, however, was glad this was the only punishment he received after assaulting a family member. Eugene sarcastically pitted himself, but Tyr just rode into him. Eugene tried asking Tyr if he could turn a blind eye a few times, but Tyr swore this was impossible, vowing to report everything, even if Eugene just showed a sign of going to the training ground. Eugene had an idea. As long as he didn't go to the training ground, Tyr wouldn't report. But Tyr would report even if Eugene just picked up a sword. Eugene felt pity for Tyr, but Tyr replied that Eugene was the one who was petty for clinging to technicalities. Since there was no sign of Tyr changing his decision, Eugene formulated a plan. He was planning to learn magic. Eugene dreamed of becoming a great wizard, just like Lord Phelan, who had saved him from his past life. Tyr thought about it and decided to turn a blind eye to Eugene studying magic, considering it not dangerous. Eugene was so happy to hear this. Eugene's life changed significantly. No longer sick, he finally experienced the happy life he had always desired. 
Although he still didn't fully understand why Lord Phelan had linked him to his past life, he promised one thing to his past self. He would give his best for both of them to live his second life to the fullest. On the other side, Adir was holding a locket necklace with a picture of Eugene. Even though Eugene had endured five years in darkness, his light hadn't faded unlike Adir's, whose light had dimmed over time. Meanwhile, Eugene started to practice his magic. As he focused, he finally managed to create a magic string. He was glad and happy that he finally did it. Pressing the string of magic he had made, it produced a sound. He realized that this magic was like a string instrument, just as described in the magic book he had read. This foundation of magic was called string. After making this magic string, he wondered what to do next. In his desire to learn magic, he scoured all the magic books and dictionaries in the Folivia library. Unfortunately, the books had problems such as different languages, missing volumes, and being so old they were impossible to decipher. So, he decided to learn on his own. He thought of asking his big brother to find a magic tutor but New Hindle would oppose it. Even if he got permission, he hesitated because the Folivia family's magic was incredible. When he was five years old, he had seen the owner of the magic hammer, Pedro of the Thunder. Everyone was amazed at how powerful Pedro was, and Eugene was one of those people watching. Because of that, he had decided never to learn magic, thinking it was too strange. But now, he was reconsidering learning unique magic. Out of nowhere, someone called him. It was his uncle Adir, who had also come into the library and wondered what Eugene was doing. Eugene showed the magic he had learned from the books, impressing Adir. All of a sudden, someone approached them and greeted Eugene. Adir introduced his youngest nephew to his companion, who was a teacher visiting from the magic school. Eugene was flustered to see a magic teacher, as they had never heard of Eugene learning about magic. They asked him when he had learned, and Eugene replied, Just now, Adir and the teacher, Estein, couldn't believe that Eugene had just started studying magic. He explained that he had gotten in trouble yesterday, so he took the opportunity to study magic while grounded. Estein asked if he had a magic teacher, and Eugene replied, I don't have one. This surprised Estein, who wondered how Eugene could learn on his own. Eugene explained that he had learned by himself using the books he read. Estein couldn't believe that he had just read magic from a book and managed to create a string, just like a babbling baby teaching itself phonetics and learning to speak. Moreover, Estein asked if she could have some of his time to confirm his talent for herself. Therefore, they went outside to evaluate Eugene. Adir noticed his talent, his powerful and mature resonance of six strings, followed by a single youthful string, weaving a distinct harmony just like a magic ensemble. Eugene was amazed, feeling a sensation he had never felt before. He realized that this was the power of the world of magic. Eugene thought about how well magicians control such unstable strings to produce precise tones and how beautifully they perform. In Estein's mind, she was astonished to see Eugene performing magic without the assistance of any professor. She realized that Eugene possessed an absolute sense akin to perfect pitch, but since magic exists beyond the realm of the five senses, this astonishing gift, coupled with the intellect to comprehend theoretical magic books on his own, was extraordinary. Estein said, Eugene, you have a talent that shines like a star, startling him. Suddenly, she grabbed him, encouraging him to enroll in the magic school. He thanked her as his dream had come true, but something was bothering him. Eugene said he needed to get permission first. She decided to handle the Guardian meeting as a teacher, so she wanted him to leave it to her. When they approached Hindal, he immediately rejected their offer. They were scared by Hindal's intense aura. He wanted to put this foolish thought out of Eugene's mind, reminding him that he was a descendant of the Folivia family, born with the duty to wield a sword and protect the horizon. Hindal warned that if Eugene planned to abandon his duty for some newfound hobby, he would end up just like his uncle Adir, a noble who ran from his duty and was never respected. Estein didn't expect the conversation to take such a heavy turn. She tried to explain that Eugene had extraordinary talent. However, Hindle was already aware of Eugene's talent, which surprised them. He had noticed his little brother's quick learning and talent since they were children. 
He had been astonished by Eugene's genius on several occasions. Since Eugene had suffered from a terrible illness and spent his childhood in confinement, Hindle understood his desire to try different things. He felt pity for him but didn't want Eugene to leave his duty to Folivia, nor did he want outsiders to meddle in their affairs. Estein, still determined, added that Eugene's magical talent was not something to classify under typical circumstances. Hindle wanted to discuss further, as Estein kept insisting on taking Eugene to the magic school. She said their reputation echoed throughout the kingdom, and they were considered the kingdom's finest swordsmen at a young age and also geniuses among geniuses. However, she knew that Eugene's magical talent was unparalleled. Eugene had no idea what Estein was talking about regarding his magic because he had just learned it. This offended Julia, who felt they didn't understand what Estein knew about the head of the family. Hindle tried to calm her since they were guests. He thanked Estein for her high regard for Eugene but remained unconvinced, as she had only known Eugene for a few hours. Estein then asked if their previous head had any historical precedence. Hindle understood it was normal to compare the history of their family. She told the history of a woman called Phelan's 13th disciple, who had an unprecedented level of ability. She claimed that Phelan's 13th disciple and Eugene were similar. This flustered Hindle and Julia, as they couldn't believe Estein's claims. Hindle finally understood why she had such high hopes for Eugene. He then asked Eugene what he truly desired, whether to be a swordsman or a mage. Eugene immediately answered that he wanted both. However, he got scolded because he could only choose one profession. If Eugene wanted to learn magic, he had to go to the magic school, and if he wanted to learn swordsmanship, he had to stay with the family. Hindle insisted that there was no way magic and swordsmanship could coexist. Eugene had a hard time deciding, but he chose to follow his heart's path from the moment he received Lord Phelan's grace and was able to stand up again. He vowed to be a person who could give back as much as he received. Therefore, he decided to become a mage like Lord Phelan. Even though he chose the magic school, he decided not to give up on swordsmanship. Hindle understood his point but really wanted Eugene to choose only one. Hindle heard his wish and approved his decision to become a mage, promising to support him. However, there was one condition. Eugene had to meet the admission requirements for the magic school within one month. If he failed, everything would be as if it never happened. This scared Eugene as common mages took 10 years to process, and his brother's demand to do it in a month was absurdly challenging. Hindle wanted to test what Estein said about Eugene's talent. Eugene, astonished, thanked him for his approval and swore he would not disappoint him. He vowed to work hard. Hindle was confused about whether Eugene truly understood what he was agreeing to. Normally, it takes 10 years to meet the minimum requirements to enter a magic school and become a mage. Hindle knew that becoming a mage in one month was truly impossible. He assumed Eugene might not understand, but he was confident that Estein was not ignorant of some facts. This made him curious about why she was so confident. A long time ago, the land was filled with nothing but chaos. Lord Phelan descended upon them, and she took pity on the polluted earth. Using magic, she drove the monsters away from the land. Although the monsters had vanished, only a desolate, lonely landscape remained. As she gazed upon the empty land, Lord Phelan suddenly felt a wave of loneliness. Therefore, she plucked stars from the sky to create twelve disciples. Together, they filled the land with life. This is the story of why the world is so peaceful and flourishing with life. It is because of Lord Phelan and her twelve disciples. Estein suddenly saw Eugene fall asleep to her story, so she assumed it was boring. However, Eugene denied it. Estein was aware that it's natural to find the story boring after hearing it so many times as a child. Moreover, she asked Eugene about his perspective when listening to Lord Phelan's story. He replied that her story was quite sentimental and brought him to tears, which made Estein so happy. Though she liked Eugene's perspective, she wanted him to look more like a mage for a moment. Eugene's understanding was that they call her the supreme being who created life above the horizon so he thought Lord Phelan was a mage instead of a god. The miracles she performed, akin to those of gods, were miracles of creation and life itself, made up of a myriad of magical strings. 
These strings of magic are like the strings of an instrument. Depending on how they are plucked, they can produce various phenomena. Just as strings can produce various sounds depending on the vibrations, they can become water, fire, wind, and lightning. They could also become life and even the world. The magic of a novice mage and the creation magic of Lord Phelan operate on the same principle within these strings. She explained that this core string can truly be seen as the alpha and omega of magic. This is why a mage's ability is absolutely dependent on the strings, how many strings they can manipulate and how well they can play them. These two aspects define a mage's ability. When Stein looked at Eugene's talent, she was glad that he was verified on that day. He also had the ability to delicately handle the strings that were innate inside him. Lastly, the remaining task was to see how many strings he could use. However, Eugene only had one string. She complimented him, explaining that it is normal for a beginner. She added that starting with one string and aiming to reach the minimum number required to influence reality beyond sound waves, which is four strings, is the entrance to practicing magic. However, Stein said that not everyone is capable of reaching the four strings because each person's number of strings is innately fixed. Therefore, they decided to borrow a measuring device to determine Eugene's potential. Eugene was nervous since he only had one string, but Stein reassured him not to worry. She explained that even though the number of strings is important, there is still another way to improve. She emphasized that there are cases where having many strings is as good as pie in the sky, meaning many young mages are too obsessed with the number of strings. However, even after Stein explained everything, Eugene had a hard time understanding what she was saying. Realizing she got a little heated, she simplified her explanation. No matter what number comes up, it's important to know how he uses it to develop. Eugene fully understood that he doesn't need to be hung up on the number of strings. Afterwards, Stein ordered him to close his eyes and focus on the image of magic as he perceives it, creating his own strength. Eugene thought about the concept of his magic and had a flashback to the force that freed him from his past and current life sufferings from the curse-like agony. After this realization, he determined that magic to him is liberation. A bright burst of magic suddenly intensified, but out of nowhere, Stein's reaction changed. She was shocked to see only one of Eugene's strings. Despite saying that the number of strings isn't that important, she believed that having only one string was hardly enough to become a mage. She began to be anxious while waiting for Stein's reaction. She apologized to Eugene, explaining that having one string means he can't be a mage. This broke his heart because she had never expected this to happen and was disappointed to give him false hope. Eugene cried hard after being disappointed in Lord Phelan for having just one string. Suddenly, his uncle Adir came up to him to cheer him up. He assured Eugene that even if this happened, he was sure he would come back from the magic class successfully. He advised him to take today's lesson as fun. Eugene burst into tears after crying hard, feeling grateful that someone was still on his side. As they got home, Eugene's face was still filled with disappointment, which Adir noticed. He asked Eugene to tell him everything that was worrying him. Eugene asked if he could still become a mage even though he couldn't. To his astonishment, Uncle Adir reminded him not to judge too soon because he still had a whole month left. Eugene knew that one month was not enough to become a mage with just one string, but Adir was sure he needed a miracle because he had already experienced one miracle in his life. Although he didn't have much knowledge about magic or understand how difficult it is, as a doctor, seeing Eugene standing again was a miracle. Half of the reason he became a doctor was to see Eugene healthy again, just like now. Eugene wanted him to stop talking about this because he felt embarrassed and sentimental. Uncle Adir said that hoping for a second miracle is just wishful thinking, but Eugene found this ridiculous, especially in just one month. However, his hope was reignited after hearing Adir's advice that a month might be too short to achieve something but was the perfect amount of time to give it his best shot. Adir helped him realize that he must not postpone his despair until after a month had passed. Eugene finally understood that it was not too late for him to try for a month. However, Adir was pretty sure that even without his advice, Eugene would just cry a bit and then try again because that's the kind of person he is. Later that night, Eugene asked Stein if it's possible for someone with just one string to become a mage. 
She replied that it's not impossible trying to make Eugene feel optimistic, but this was purely theoretical. It was hard for her to tell a student that it was possible. Nevertheless, Eugene was determined and didn't care how hard it would be. This time, he was resolved to try without regrets, even though he was discouraged by having just one string. Estein realized that she had really failed as a teacher because she gave up immediately, even though her student hadn't given up yet. Therefore, they decided to try once more, even though they knew it would be hard for Eugene. Just like earlier, Estein reminded him that he needed four strings to use magic, but that didn't mean he couldn't use magic with fewer strings. A way to use his magic with one string was to use that single string as if it were four. The next day, Eugene didn't waste any time practicing his string. Unfortunately, it burst multiple times. He felt frustrated after failing repeatedly because the string burst so quickly when he tried to rush it. Eugene was thinking of an idea since he couldn't understand how to use one string like four. He began to think weird thoughts but realized he must stop and focus. It was hard, but he was determined to succeed. Suddenly, someone came in. It was Edric's grandson, who teased him for having one string and kept on practicing. Eugene stood up and threatened the same guy he had beaten earlier. Edric's grandson got irritated, swearing that if they were in a proper duel, Eugene could have died. He proposed a proper fight to determine who was better. Edric's grandson was actually into this competition, but he suggested they compete with honor, befitting members of the Folivia family. He proposed they hunt a demonic beast, which flustered Eugene because it was ridiculous. Eugene backed off so they thought he was scared. He explained that it was dangerous because demonic beast hunting isn't child's play. Even though this was the reason, they were still determined to move forward. They thought Eugene misunderstood them because this was an actual request for help from another village, which confused him. Suddenly, a kid came out of the woods, surprising Eugene. The kid reported that the adults had been captured by the demonic beast, and he didn't know what to do alone. Eugene saw this as a serious matter because there were victims involved and immediately checked the kid's condition. However, the kid was actually a girl, though Eugene mistook her for a boy. Edric's grandson was determined not to tell the adults because they believed the adults would act ineffectively. Eugene got mad at his ignorance, being more concerned about the hunt than the victims. Edric's grandson replied that the kid was from a slash-and-burn village, which surprised Eugene. He had no idea about this, so Edric's grandson explained that reporting a slash-and-burn village would result in the village being destroyed and the villagers either exiled or sentenced to forced labor. This meant they had no other choice, and Edric's grandson had nothing to lose. He would gain honor by catching a troublesome group of villagers. Afterwards, they headed to the village. Suddenly, a demonic beast appeared out of nowhere. They panicked, but quickly unsheathed their swords to exterminate it. Eugene chased the demonic beast, which was scared of him. However, as Eugene ventured deeper into the woods, something eerie happened. Someone was observing his every move. Meanwhile, Eugene was determined to stop the demonic beast from running away. He decided to use his magic to stun the beast. Finally, he reached the demonic beast and ended its life. He was happy to have caught it using his magic, but his happiness was interrupted when the brothers teased him for making noise after catching just one demonic beast. They were confused about how far he had traveled just to catch one, taking so long. Upon returning to the village, Eugene was surprised to see that the other guy had caught many demonic beasts on his own and had won their bet. Eugene felt frustrated but was amazed by their talent. He analyzed their methods, they relied on precision and targeted the weaknesses of the demonic beasts. This made him realize the expertise of the Folivia family, known for their pinpoint attacks that penetrate the essence. Despite being annoyed, he was still impressed by their strength. Out of nowhere, the kid complimented him for catching one demonic beast but felt hesitant because she couldn't repay them. The brothers were mad at her because, as slash-and-burn villagers, they had nothing of value. They asked her if she had any idea where the villagers might have been taken. She explained that when she woke up, everyone had vanished, and she didn't know where they had gone. They were flustered to hear that the demonic beast might have taken the villagers and got mad at her for being clueless. They had no other choice but to find out what they could before heading back. 
Eugene realized that the twin brothers were responsible despite their rudeness. They ordered Eugene to take care of the demonic beast's corpse and the kid while they scouted around. Eugene wanted to help, but they rudely told him their roles were assigned based on ability, which frustrated him more. He burned all the demonic beast corpses and then went inside one of the villagers' houses. He called someone Grandpa and scolded him for staying because the demonic beasts might be agitated by the hard work done to their land. Eugene swore he wouldn't report them to the adults, so he wanted the old man to promise no more burning fields. Suddenly, the old man's reaction shifted. He was grateful for what Eugene said. Eugene didn't want to bring up sensitive matters, so he asked the old man if he had any explanation for the situation. The old man, getting irritated, sarcastically said that when you're old, you even forget what happened yesterday or today. Eugene decided to look for clues himself. As he was about to leave, the kid wanted to come with him. Eugene was concerned about her walking for a long time. Suddenly, the old man stopped him, calling the kid to stay by his side, apologizing for her immaturity. Eugene noticed a change in the old man's mood and realized something was wrong. The old man said he would wash the kid and put her to bed. Eugene realized the old man didn't actually know this kid. As Jean was going to reveal that she wasn't a boy, Eugene stood up, wanting to take the kid with him. He made an excuse, saying he had second thoughts about having someone guide him, which might be a good idea. The old man agreed, but just as they were about to leave, the old man called them back and began speaking nonsense about their lives. He wanted them to understand that they were lowly beings and that nothing could change the fact that they were seen as trash by the noble people. When they finally went outside, Eugene immediately asked Jean how long the chief had been acting strangely. She replied that it had been about a month. She said that while he seemed okay today before, he was all over the place and didn't even recognize the villagers. Suddenly, he started drawing strange pictures while making noises that no one could understand. That's why the adults said the village chief had gone insane and everyone was gossiping about it. As she mentioned the drawing, Eugene asked where it was. To his surprise, he couldn't believe what he just witnessed because the people of Folivia learned this symbol before reading and writing. This symbol is the mark of their nemesis, and when they are involved, things get complicated. The good news is that Folivia knows this nemesis's behavior better than anyone else. Moreover, he asked Jean if there was a large cave nearby, so Jean pointed to a cave that she was warned by the adults not to go to. Human madness and mysterious disappearances generally stemmed from one source, abyss worshippers. Even after the first mage fell and descended, those who worshipped the abyss, the old master of the horizon regarded Phelan, who came down from the stars, as an usurper. To wash away the original sin of being born as Phelan's creation, they offered humans, fellow creations of Phelan, as sacrifices. Jean couldn't believe what she just witnessed. She immediately ran towards her uncle and sister, horrified to see something she could never imagine. As he was about to report this to the adults, someone mumbled behind him. They were horrified to see it was the same old man from earlier who worshipped the abyss. He wanted the children of Phelan to be burned, buried in wells, and fed to dogs. He was agitated at the Folivia family for always interfering when they were too close to their goal. Jean couldn't understand what was happening. While Eugene was surprised to see the old man was a mage, and now about to attack them. Luckily, they avoided the flame that lunged toward them. Eugene was confused about why there was a powerful mage in a place like this. He began to think of a way out because he couldn't abandon the people and run, and even if he fought, there was no chance of winning, and the others might get caught in the magic. This made him feel like a disappointment to his brother for being unable to wield a sword with magic. He was now depressed, full of regrets, and unable to clear his head. Suddenly, he heard Jean screaming because a demonic beast was in front of them and about to attack. Eugene immediately acted, swiftly stopping the beasts and killing them one by one. He decided to save his regrets and worries for later. Right now, he needed to focus on protecting those he cared about. The demonic beast chief immediately cast flame magic to attack him. Eugene concentrated, knowing he must cut through the magic to protect everyone because that was the Folivia way. The sword of Folivia could pierce through the abyss, and the techniques of Folivia were developed over dozens of generations for the sole purpose of confronting the abyss. 
One of their techniques was the Eyes of Folivia, an intuition born from unique training and practical combat experience. Some could foresee an enemy's next move, others could perceive weaknesses, and some even claimed to see the strings that composed magic. This technique had reached the realms of magic through the ages, but it was not something Eugene could master instantly. However, if he limited it to magic strings alone, he had a chance. Just then, the demonic beast chief started to throw powerful flames at him, but Eugene managed to cut through the magic. They were astonished to see an amateur displaying such power. Even Eugene couldn't believe he had done it by trusting himself and using the string handling he'd been secretly practicing to master. The demonic beast chief got irritated after his chant was dispelled by Eugene. Despite this, he had an alternate plan that surprised Eugene. Suddenly, lightning hit Eugene's chest, causing an explosion. Gene was shocked to see Eugene fly away. Fortunately, Eugene's coat had a protective enchantment that minimized the damage. He assumed the demonic beast chief was weaker because of its speed, but he knew that if he didn't manage to block the next attack, it would be over for them. Using the eyes of Folivia, he focused on each individual string that was impossible to see. Suddenly, he was flustered to see the demonic beast chief using an polyphonic spellcasting, meaning multiple spellcasting. He immediately called Jean to get behind him. Eugene tried his best to block every single magic attack that lunged toward him. Unfortunately, due to the number of consecutive attacks and their speed, he had a hard time handling them. His stamina was running out, and he began to mishit other magic spells. He thought this might be his end due to his lack of something crucial. Suddenly, he remembered the cut of the strings and what Istin taught him about using the vibration of a string to become magic. At least four strings must come together to form a harmony, but for someone like Eugene, with only one string aiming to become a mage, he had to overcome the absurdity of using one string as if it were four. He realized that the moment he cut the string, the magic would dissipate into meaningless sound waves. However, if he could weave the sound at the exact moment before it dispersed, he believed it was possible. The demonic beast chief was celebrating his victory after seeing Eugene struggling, but suddenly something happened. Eugene broke through his limits and dashed toward the demonic beast chief. Fully determined to execute this monster, Eugene's determination caused the demonic beast chief to panic. Eugene used the Folivia-style quadruple slash to cut the string. Suddenly, a burst of flame engulfed the demonic beast chief's body. He couldn't believe that Eugene was an actual mage all this time, as he had never seen him trigger his magic. However, he realized that the swings Eugene made in the air were magic triggers, cutting his own strings to activate the magic. He still couldn't believe that such a technique could possibly exist. Afterwards, they headed back to the village, having captured the demonic beast chief who had caused the town so much misery. They also rescued the people who were almost sacrificed to the abyss. Suddenly, Eugene felt a sharp pain in his chest from overexerting himself. He tried to act fine, but unfortunately, these were the only people they had managed to save. Jean felt sad, realizing these were the only survivors of the incident. Eugene was worried about the others because they knew something dangerous might happen, so he wanted to get back as soon as possible. Unfortunately, his twin brother hadn't returned yet. Out of nowhere, Jean called Eugene. She asked if the village chief had caused this commotion among the villagers. Eugene explained that they must not resent their chief because this was not their actual chief. It was someone from the Abyss worshippers disguised as him. Since Jean was so young, Eugene had a hard time telling her the truth that their village chief was probably dead. Somehow, she guessed what might have happened to their chief. In these times, death was all too familiar, so even a young child learned to accept it like an adult, just as Eugene had before Lord Phelan's salvation. He felt guilty that Jean was saved while the others had unfortunately died. Jean asked why the Abyss worshippers did this. Eugene replied that they believed it was the way to atone for the original sin and that it pleased the Abyss. This is why they approached people in desperate need of help with honeyed words about salvation and deceived them. He advised Jean not to be fooled by their words because, in the end, their salvation would end just like their chiefs. Suddenly, the demonic beast chief spoke. He asked Eugene if they truly cared about the lives at the bottom of their world. 
He pointed out the people who chased emptiness and continued the chain of sacrifice, accusing Eugene of arrogance and thinking he was only right and just. Eugene stood his ground, stating that people should strive to fix their flaws themselves. He shouted that they do not pray to a malevolent deity and demand human sacrifices because they only delude themselves that the world's flaws justify their wicked deeds. He also questioned the point of sacrificing people to hide their lies and deception. As Eugene was about to say more, something stopped him. He began laughing maniacally, suddenly declaring that the abyss had answered his prayer. At that moment, Eugene's twin brother arrived, warning that they must leave the village as soon as possible. Eugene ran towards him and asked what had happened to Rock, noticing his injured leg. Rock replied that it was nothing and that he could still fight, but there was something he needed to say. He regretted not listening to Eugene earlier. Suddenly, an eye popped up in the sky. It was the eye of the abyss. Moments later, an abyss creature began emerging from it. Eugene couldn't comprehend what was happening. Meanwhile, the demonic beast chief grew excited, declaring that the abyss had sent forth its envoy for their devotees. A comical creature materialized in front of Eugene. Meanwhile, Adir was in his room, noting it was late while looking at a picture with only Eugene's face on it. He thought that it was time to meet them. Meanwhile, the abyss creature was lurking above Eugene, who was terrified at the sight of this huge monster. Gritting his teeth, he called out to Rob and asked him to evacuate the villagers while he held off the beast. Eugene apologized for asking for help while injured, but Rob assured him he was fine. Rob was cut off mid-sentence when he noticed someone. Looking at the demonic chief, he concluded that he might be an abyss worshipper and wondered what had happened in their absence. Turning back to his brother, Eugene, he acknowledged Eugene's courage and, frustratingly, gritted his teeth. While Eugene was helping the villagers, he, suddenly, Rob brought his sword blade in front of Eugene, saying that he had guts but was stupid. With a confident gaze, he asked Eugene to save the villagers while he blocked the creature. This made Eugene flustered and worried about Rob's injury. Rob asked him to face reality because he couldn't evacuate anyone with his injured leg, so Eugene had to do it. Rob assured him he wouldn't die there and asked Eugene to evacuate the villagers and inform the family. Rob told him he had done his job well, but now it was Eugene's turn, which made Eugene worriedly call his name. Facing the creature, Rob asked Eugene to let him take responsibility for dragging him into this mess. Eugene gritted his teeth with tears in his eyes. Suddenly, the demonic chief laughed, shouting that they were all finished. Both looked back as the chief commanded the creature to take the offering's lives to replace his broken flesh. This statement caught Eugene and Rob's attention, indicating the creature was not in its prime form. Eugene drew his sword, resolving to end the creature's life while it was incomplete. Looking at the giant abyss monster, he wondered how a human could stand against it. Sweat rolled down his face, but he encouraged himself not to be afraid. He asked Rob if they were going to fight the thing together, which made Rob flustered and shouted him to just go. Our protagonist realized that this much commotion would surely get the family's attention and assured Rob that Folivia's would surely come. But Rob, irritated, asked what difference it made if they fought together. Eugene asked him to just trust. Rob noticed the skilled eyes Felicia used by Eugene. Meanwhile, Eugene thought he couldn't fight head-on with the thing so he decided to dodge the attacks. But a huge hit was already coming in his direction. His eyes widened in fear as the monster hit them with a force that sent gusts of wind in every direction. They were sent flying and Eugene was in shock. His sword fell from his hand, and the creature looked at them with its big one eye. Eugene coughed out blood upon hitting the ground and wondered how this much destruction was caused by just one punch from an abyss monster. The demon chief was also surprised and started mocking Eugene for overestimating their belief. Filled with tears and guilt, he apologized in his heart for not listening to Rob's advice. At least some people might have been saved. He wondered if his brother had been in his place, the outcome might have been different. Suddenly, the abyss monster started preparing for an attack, and the demonic chief admitted the magic would be powerful enough to obliterate everything. Light formed, and energy gathered in front of the creature while the demon chief worshipped it. 
Gritting his teeth, Eugene mustered his strength by holding the ground. He stood up, admitting his lack of power, and the demonic chief was confused about how this kid could move. Eugene, now facing the danger, gritted his lips as the monster shot a laser beam towards him. The laser beam headed towards him, but he remained calm, mumbling something. Eugene expressed with resolve that as long as he could move, he would protect everyone. The monster's attack landed on the spot but was deflected towards the sky. The beam passed through the sky and made a huge crack. The demon chief fell back in fear and disbelief, wondering how this kid cut through the attack. Inspecting closely, he admitted that amidst the cascading flood of magic power, Eugene read the flow of strings and cut through it. The demon chief wondered how this was possible and if there was any magic this kid couldn't cut through. Eugene looked at his sword's broken blade and laughed but soon collapsed due to exhaustion. The demonic chief looked at the stars of the usurper and wondered why they were watching over this kid. He realized the abyss monster was in a rush and, despite being low on magic, chose to end the kid instead of taking offerings. Looking at RMC, he thought about who this kid was and realized he had to end his life before he could grow more and lunged at Eugene. Suddenly, someone cut off the demon chief's head. It was Uncle Adir, stating that it might be difficult because this kid was his nephew. Then he took Eugene in his hands. Adir expressed that he would not stay still and leave his nephew to die. Some time later, under the night sky, Eugene opened his eyes. Startled to find himself in Adir's arms, he asked why he was there. Uncle Adir told him he was there to fetch him and was relieved he wasn't late. Eugene suddenly remembered the monster and shouted at his uncle to flee. Uncle Adir told him to calm down and not to worry because it was all over. The monster was lying behind him, defeated. Eugene looked back and then confusingly looked at his uncle. His uncle just asked him to go back for now and save the talk for later. Sometime later, Eugene is walking down the street when he notices beautiful pink flowers. He asks the lady for the price of these flowers and she is happy to see Eugene. She asks why he wants to buy them, perhaps suggesting he has a girlfriend, but he shyly replies that he is going to visit his friend in the hospital. She worriedly asks if he is going to see the twin masters. She expresses that she has heard the story of the master venturing into the forest to annihilate demonic beasts and asks if he was hurt. Eugene assures her that he is fine and asks how she knows about the story. The lady, with a smile, reveals that the story of the young master saving the village from demonic beasts is already buzzing around the town. He shockingly asks how everyone found out because the family council is still in session. The lady proudly replies that there is more than one family in this town. She explains that the masters acted on their own, which reminds him of his elder brother because he forgot about it all. The lady brings forward the bouquet of pink flowers and asks him to take it as a gift. Eugene thanks her but hesitates to take the flowers, but she insists, saying it is the least she could do for the young master. She tells him that he has shown bravery at a very young age, so take this as support. The lady warns him not to resist, otherwise, it would never end, which confuses Eugene. As he walks past the street, everyone gathers around him, offering him gifts. The gifts are so many that he can't carry them all. Later, he arrives at the hospital, and the twin brothers notice him. He brings all the gifts with him, and his cousin asks about them. Eugene explains that the gifts were given by the townsfolk when he went to buy flowers. He says he will leave the flowers there, to which his cousin replies to do whatever he wants. Edric's grandson expresses that the gifts are too much, perhaps because the townsfolk assume this might be their first battle. Folivia warriors often get such hospitality on their first outing. He admits he has never seen so many gifts at once, which makes sense to Eugene. Eugene apologizes for ending up receiving all the hospitality alone, which his cousins do not mind. One of the twins asks him how he is walking after being injured so badly. Eugene, looking at his palm, expresses that nothing major happened aside from some scratches. With enlightenment, he utters that this might be because he already suffered in advance for five years. With a gloomy expression, his twins tell him that it is not funny. With a sullen face, Eugene says they are fine, so it is time for him to go. His cousin looks at him with a smile. Suddenly, 
He calls Eugene and apologizes for his previous behavior, which catches him off guard. His cousin goes on to say that in the past, he thought of him as a freeloader, but seeing him that day, he admits he was wrong, and Eugene proves to be a Folivia more than anyone else. Our protagonist, with a shy expression, reveals that he also thinks of them as obnoxious brats who just relied on the title, which makes the twins feel insulted. One of the brothers asks him to stop this talk and tells him to explain how he survived and what happened that day. Sweating, Eugene replies that nothing special happened. The monster was an incomplete resurrection, so it collapsed on its own. After a while, his uncle appeared on time and took care of the aftermath. The twins are a bit confused, and Eugene thinks this is the story he and his uncle agreed on. The twins ask each other if the story is anticlimactic, to which both agree. Eugene lets out a sigh of relief. He waves his hand and tells them that he is going to be scolded by Tyre for being late, but his cousins stop him. Turning his gaze to the side, one of the twins says that not much but wants to say thanks for visiting them. This statement pleases RMC, and with a big smile, he tells them this is what a friend should do. The civilians of the domain gladly bless the warriors who protect their land, and in return, the warriors face the abyss to live up to their expectations. It's a simple but ideal relationship, which is why the Folivia family is on the front line fighting the abyss and has achieved such a place. Thinking this way, Eugene understands why his family tormented him and his uncle. If the honor of the Folivia family is tarnished, then all this could crumble. Perhaps that is what they are thinking. Eugene also trembles with fear but overcomes it with the pride of being a Folivia. If Folivia didn't bestow his pride, then none of it would be possible. Even so, this does not justify the harsh and cruel treatment of the family towards his uncle. The family's expectations rested on Eugene's father, but after the injury in the Northern War, his father will no longer be able to wield a sword. So all the family's expectations shifted from his father to his young uncle. But Eugene's uncle preferred books over swordsmanship, and when it became clear that he had no talent like his brother, everyone, led by his grandfather, started harassing, scorning, and ignoring his uncle. Eugene also received scorn for being bedridden, but in his case, he has his family and Tyre on his side. But his uncle has no one, and his days have been more painful. With a smile, Eugene thinks that despite all this, his uncle never gave up. He never lost his gentle nature and also became a doctor to help people. He also overcame the lack of talent in swordsmanship by becoming a swordsman that rivaled the best in their family. Idir notices him and asks why he is staring at him and if he has something to say. With a bright face, Eugene expresses that he wants to become like his uncle. Idir smiles at his statement and thinks it would be disastrous if Eugene became like his uncle. In Idir's memory, he is bandaging himself when his subordinate comes in and asks about his condition. Idir replies that it is not good. The blood loss is significant and his muscles are torn, but having this much damage after facing the Abyss King is fortunate. His subordinate questions and then yells at him, saying that what is fortunate about it is he doesn't know how much effort they had put in to prepare that being. He shouts that the Abyss King is going to handle a war front, but killing it like this, how are they going to handle demons like the General? Not to mention he just sustained 20% of his strength. He shouts, asking if Adir is going goofy over the pretend family play with that kid Eugene. Adir puts a blade in his mouth and calls him by his name, Ilias, which scares the guy. Slashing the blade, Adir expresses that his behavior is inappropriate. He grips the guy by his hair and asks if the brat of Folivia wiped out on the spot, would he think he could handle the rage of the Folivia family? With a threatening tone, Idir tells him that because of his foolishly resurrecting the king, all of this happened, and yet he raised his voice in front of him. His lackey apologizes for his rudeness and reveals that he assumed Idir might forget about the great cause. He again apologizes for his thinking and behavior and is ready to accept any punishment. The guy explains that they were not the ones who resurrected the Abyss King because they lacked the sacrificial offering. Idir, with disappointment, says that his actions are always like this. Regardless, the plan remains unimpeded, and he has no expectations of him from the start. With a menacing tone, Idir exclaims that he will personally bring death upon the head of the Folivia family, Hindle Folivia. 
He says that the downfall of Folivia will proceed just as planned, and on the prophesied night by the abyss, the Folivia family will be annihilated. Later, our MC is practicing his swordsmanship and uses Folivia's eye. He demonstrates Folivia's four strings cut, which sends slashes forward. Catching his breath, he asks his teacher about it and explains that this is different from her teachings, but still, he manages to use magic. He reveals that because of his life and death situation, he remembered her teaching and improvised this method on the spot. Eugene asks if his magic is correct. His teacher, in shock, says that she didn't know but this is scary. That's all the time we have for today. If you want to watch the next part, please like and subscribe. Thank you and see you on to the next one.